quickly. Uh, we were trying to get you. <laughs> okay. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Marbella Moreno. I will actually be presenting the first half of our presentation and then I'll pass it over to my co-host, uh, Matt. He will be presenting the best part, which is um, the financial aid and how to actually start saving um, some money. So we will get a, go ahead and get started. Can I? Okay. Yep. So this is a little bit about ourselves, um, what my college planning team does, and then who we represent. Um, so our main uh, focus is obviously to make sure that uh, our families are financially knowledgeable and skilled with uh, their choices with college and also their um, payment process. So we are composed of academic and financial professionals. Uh, so we do both the public and private sectors. Uh, we all have various skills and we come from different professions. Um, all of us have master degrees or higher within the profession that we are. Um, we also use uh, the financial industrial uh, regulatory authority um, software when we're doing financial aid. Um, and then also we do have experience in all sectors in terms of college planning, preparation and funding strategies. So we have a wide variety of uh, professionals within our team that help families prepare for basically every step of the college process. Okay, so our mission, so our main mission is to use the power of our team um, so that no stone is left unturned to help families reduce costs at the right fit college. Um, so we make sure to give you every strategy and tip that we have to make sure that every um, option that you have to reduce that college um, cost is actually um, advised to you. Uh, so this would be our, our main mission that we go by. Okay. And then um, one of these quotes that uh, I love to share with families and that we're very proud of is one where it says, when it comes to paying for college, there are two prices that people tend to pay. One is for the informed and one is for the uninformed. Um, and this uh, quote is very important, especially for um, people who have attended um, or are currently attending because you are actually taking the right step uh, with the college planning and that's actually gathering all the information and knowing all your options even before starting the process in paying for college. Okay, and then getting the help in the planning process. Um, so there's different um, places that you can actually look for and get support with. One would be like the private scholarships, um, high school counselors, the colleges themselves, and then the family accountant. And all of these can be useful, but they also have um, some drawbacks as well. Uh, so then it's good to get um, information from different as um, different different parts. Um, but like I said, they all come with their benefits and their withdrawals. Uh, and then we're hoping to get you the most up to date information. And then for what um, one of the examples that we have is like the myth about planning, uh, for example, the tax accountants, um, they might be great at helping you provide for your taxes, but they're not experts with financial with the financial aid process. Um, so some advantages that you might get with like tax deductions, they can actually affect your financial aid options. Um, so then we want to make sure, like I said, to get the most up to date information and preparing before even starting your financial aid. And then cost of attendance. So there's something that's called the COA. Um, it's known as cost of attendance, which basically means how much you would be paying throughout the year. Um, and also just within the four, well, the four year span. Um, so you can see that the average cost of colleges really depends on what type of college you'll be attending. If you can see the average cost of an Illinois public school um, compared to the cost of attending a private school and then those elite universities. So you can see that the price um, varies. Um, but one thing that you can keep in mind is that um, the prices will keep going up. So then the tuition increases twice the rate of inflation. Um, so you can see how those prices will continue to keep going up um, as, as the time progresses. And then average time in college. So the average time um, that a student takes to graduate college is about 5.8 years. Uh, we wanna make sure that our students are graduating in less than that time because for every year or every semester that they are spending in college, 
they are paying for that semester. Uh, but this is just an average 5.8 years is usually what a student takes to graduate with their four year degree. And then the risks are, are clear. The current, the current norm is that 30% of, of freshmen do not return back as a sophomore. So these are um, what's actually causing some of those stats of graduating in the 5.8 years. So again, 30% of freshmen are not returning back for their sophomore year. 33% of, of students are actually transferring schools. Um, and then, like I had mentioned, seven, about 75% of returning sophomores um, take about four four years, four plus years to actually graduate. Again, the longer the time they're spending in college, the more money it's actually costing them. And then college is worth it. Um, so if you can tell uh, just even by the different levels of that students will be attending. So you can see the high school diploma um, compared to the professional degree. And this is in terms of how much they're making in terms of their lifetime. And then you can clearly see that college is worth it. The higher your degree grows, the more likely you are to be earning more income compared to those with just a high school degree or lower. And then when we ask parents and families, is college worth it? 97% of families say yes. Um, sending their student to college is completely worth it and is worth the investment of their time. But those same parents, when we ask the same family members, only 44% of them actually have some type of plan or strategy to actually um, pay for that student's um, college investment. Um, so that's a huge difference from pretty much 97% agreeing that yes, it's an investment, but only 44 saying that yes, we actually have a plan to pay for those uh, for, for our education. Um, so luckily, we will actually be giving some tips and advice today on how we can actually start planning. So hopefully we can increase those 44% of people who are, are not prepared yet uh, with getting some more advice. So I'm going to pass it over to my co-host who will be going into detail with the most important part, which is the financial aid process. All right, great. Thanks so much, Mirabella. Um, like you said, my name is Matt Gerzadich, um, and I've worked in student finance offices for over 10 years now. Um, so really I've seen quite a bit of change uh, throughout those 10 years. And uh, we're going to get into some of the financial pieces here coming up. Uh, there's some big changes on the horizon. Uh, we haven't seen uh, changes in financial aid in, in over 15 years, uh, and, and it's really going to be coming down in, in a few years. So we'll talk more about that. But um, wanted to first kind of talk about scholarships, really get into um, some of the information about them, what we're doing with them, how we can really use them to our advantage. Because uh, it sounds easy, right? Just get scholarships, but it's really not that simple. So really, we want to be using this merit aid to kind of boost the academic standing of where we're at, right? So um, there's a lot of schools out there that are going to be offering those top-notch students a lot of money to get them to come through, right? Northwestern is a great example. They're going to be filling 100% of your demonstrated need. If you can get into Northwestern, they want you to be there, right? That's what they're looking at. So um, there's really a lot of things that you've got to kind of figure out first, right? There's a lot of factors that go into it. First off, there's really over 4,000 colleges in the United States alone. Like, where do you even start with that? I mean, that 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 task itself is daunting enough. Um, but really, how do we do this? It might sound corny or cheesy, but it really begins with the student, right? You, you've got to know what those fit factors are and why they're choosing that that school. Uh, they have to choose them for the right reasons. Um, if they if they don't, uh, right, they can offer all of this merit aid and all of these things that are, are wonderful to have. But if they don't like the school, if it's not a fit for them, it's still going to take them longer to graduate and they're going to run out of that merit money. It's just not going to be there. Um, so really, don't just go off uh, into your college visits and uh, just not having a strong sense of why you're being there. Right. That's the question that you want to be asking yourself as you go through these visits with your children. Um, again. You've also got to be smart about it, right? Um, you, you can't go to the, oh, wow, like I didn't think the, I would like this college because it's too big or too small or they've got a nice fountain, all of these things, right? You can't make sure that you're, you're, you're not going there for the wrong reason and, and choosing those things. Um, so really the point of this is that you want to base it off of your fit factors. What's your personality, your learning style, what you're seeking on, the, on a campus culture. All of those things are really going to determine whether or not you're going to persist for those four years. So this merit aid and what they're offering might be great, but you've got to remember a lot of times that's also a marketing tool that they use. It's not the only reason you should be accepting whether or not you go to a specific school. 
So the best way you can really improve that is going to be in, in looking and improving your test scores, right? So I know a lot of times this year, uh, you know, we're, the, the question we get a lot is, is the ACT or SAT going away? Um, and to be honest with you, I'm going to say no. Um, you know, it, it's still debatable. Some schools are going test optional. And I'll show you an example of that here in just a minute. But if you ask me my opinion, they're going to come back, um, right? These tests are still going to show their merits on those. So uh, what I want to point out here is that this is just from uh, Miami of Ohio, right? This is what they use for, um, for scholarships on theirs. You can see the difference between uh, just going up 27 to a 28 on an ACT score, just one point difference, you're looking at a big jump, right? From 3,000 to 8,000 annually. So you've really got to know. Now, it's not realistic to say with a little bit of tutoring, I can get from a 27 to a 33. That's not really realistic, right? But if it is that point where you've taken it a couple times and you're thinking, well, maybe it might be helpful. It really is. One point can make a huge difference on that. So I'm not saying you need to go out and spend thousands of dollars on on, on tutoring for ACT prep, but a, a couple hundred dollar investment might be worthwhile. We're talking about $8,000 a year times that by four. That would be the savings of one point difference on that ACT. Uh, so that's something that we do strongly recommend. This is what Miami looks like when they kind of went test optional this year. So a lot of things that we don't really know is, uh, is this going to stick around? Is it not? Like I said, I think that the ACT and SAT are going to be uh, coming back uh, in a big way. But a lot of schools have gone to this test optional. And all they're doing really is looking at your GPA uh, from high school um, and kind of working through that and basing off those, those funds off tuition. But what you can see here is that those numbers they are a lot lower, right? So they're not necessarily going to be what they would for the ACT because they don't know the rigor of those high schools. Uh, each individual one, what they can do, they do know what the rigor of the SAT or ACT would be. So um, again, I still think that if you have the option to take it, a lot of families are in that option right now, like, well, I got canceled. Should I take it? do recommend taking it if you have that option. I'm not saying like you need to drive out of state or anything along those lines, but uh, if you have the option to take it, I do recommend it because again, it gives you another basis point of what you can use to kind of figure out your financial package with that school. All right, so that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of merit scholarships, things that the colleges are going to be offering you directly. For what we're looking at, the outside scholarships are going to be something else you can factor in. There's a couple of things that we want to talk about with this one. Uh, first one, there's some scams out there. There's lots of scams out there. So never provide your social security number or any kind of banking information. It's a scam. They'll never ask you for any of that information. First name and, and some demographic information should be, uh, first, last name and demographic information, really all they need. They're not going to be sending you a direct deposit fund or anything like that. If anything, they're going to send it directly to the school so they know that it gets applied on your behalf. So never provide that information. Uh, also, never pay for an application fee. If it says, hey, there's an application a fee that goes along with submitting the scholarship, it's a scam. Go the other direction. Um, it kind of goes against the idea of we're going to give you free money, but you got to pay for it first, right? So um, you really want to make sure you're avoiding those. Same thing with anything that has a, a promise of like a high success rate. Um, again, they're scams. No, no, no scholarship that's going to be worth its merit is going to say, well, 98% of our applicants receive this. They, they won't need to claim that if they're legitimate. So um, you want to avoid those as well. Um, those are just a couple of the things you want to look out for. Um, again, uh, there, there's a, a lot of other good sites out there. We'll get into the, some of those in just a minute, but um, really just protect your information. There's a lot of scams out there. I always recommend if you're doing outside scholarships, create like a dummy email, like for your scholarships uh, at you know, Gmail, any free account and have all of your, your offers go to that. So then you can kind of filter through because you will get spammed even in the, even with the good ones, right? Even the legitimate ones, you're gonna get scam, uh, spammed with a lot of emails. So uh, setting up a separate account is never a bad idea. Now, when you've got those outside scholarships, right? You've been uh, applied for them, you've got them. You really wanna make sure you understand how the college is going to treat those outside scholarships, right? If the information um, isn't really clear, you, you've got to ask specifically to the financial aid office how they're going to be using that outside scholarship and if it's going to be used to fill unmet need. Um, you've really got to make sure they're doing it because what would happen is um, at, at a lot of schools that we're finding, 
they'll take that outside scholarship money and they'll just reduce the funding that they were going to give you in terms of merit aid or some other sort of funding that they were offering. Um, so you don't wanna just kind of move those funds around. You wanna make sure that the school's maximizing all of those things. Finally, you've gotta remember that colleges are businesses, right? It's sad, but it's true. They're out there trying to make sure that they're uh, getting what they're uh, needing for in terms of enrollment and, and trying to do that. So you can use that against them. So really, if you've got if your student is in a high demand based on uh, particular skills or interests, um, you can often get more money from that. If they're in the top 20 percent of the incoming freshman class, they're going to get uh, better merit aid offers as they go through that. If you're trying to figure out if they're in that top 20% of incoming freshmen, um, go on their website, take a look around on that because they'll usually tell you on there or specifically ask the financial aid office. Um, they'll give you that information so that you can kind of one, see well, that's what we're going through. So um, it kind of gives you an idea of uh, where they're at and whether or not they're in that top 20%. Because really, you want to be maximizing all of that aid that they're going to give you. All right, so those are what you're looking at in terms of merit aid, outside scholarships. Um, before I go forward, I'll give you a couple of websites. Uh, Webbest uh, is a really good web. I'm sorry, Fast Web, not Webbest. Fast Web. Uh, Fast Web is uh, going to be um, a great uh, scholarship service where you can kind of put in a profile, uh, go and get all your information put in there. Uh, you can make a, a profile that gives you lots of options to where you can just have them sent to you, and they'll say, "Hey, you would be a fit for these," and then the student can go through and apply on their phone. Um, again, just make sure you're avoiding those scams is where you can, but um, that's a really great place to get started on some outside scholarships. Also check with your church, uh, unions, um, even the high school themselves, they've often got some that they uh, can offer for you. So really uh, look any and everywhere for those. But now we're going to talk about grants, right? So that it's, that's the other side of the coin of, well, I, I hear this a lot of, well, I'm not going to get anything so I'm not going to apply for FAFSA. I don't qualify for anything. It's not necessarily true. There's a lot of different things out there. So we'll kind of break them down here for you. Um, but uh, again, sticking with the theme of college being a business, the financial aid officer's job is to protect the college and to give away as little money as possible. Your job uh, as financial aid, uh, to get financial aid is to use those rules against them, right? To make your contribution as small as possible. So um, this is the same uh, author from that Paying for College that uh, Maribel uh, quoted before. It's a great book. Uh, if, you, if you get a chance to read it, uh, Paying for College, it used to be called Paying for College Without Going Broke. Uh, now it's just called Paying for Col Co uh, College by Kalman Cheney. So it's a great book to pick up. Uh, I think the Aurora Public Library has several copies of it, if I'm not mistaken. So um, make sure you check that out. Um, so why do I have this up here on the screen in terms of grouping? You've got to know what group you fall in to know what you need to be looking for, what you need to be eligible for. Uh, so we've got group one families. Um, if, if you've got a, an, a household income of less than 75,000, your job is really to make sure that you are getting as much state and federal, any institutional aid that's available to you. Um, now, I will say that some of that state and federal aid is provided to colleges in the form of what's called block funding or block grants. Um, so the colleges do have some discretion on how they distribute that money. Um, again, they can also run out in a month or two um, if, 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 you, if you wait on it. So really, your first job is make sure you're filling out that FAFSA as early as possible. Uh, that's October 1st of your student's senior year. So you can fill that out then. You don't have to wait up till midnight on, on uh, October 1st to make sure that you get it. But within a week or two, you want to make sure that you've got that completed. So that way, even if you don't know what school you're going to yet, you're going to be earmarked for those funds because you already have completed that on time. Now, group two families, you've got an income between 75000 and 200000 Really, you've got the biggest challenge in paying for college. Um, a lot of the middle income families are both unable to save enough to pay for college. Uh, and at the same time, you're not really eligible for any federal or state aid as well. So um, some of the strategies that we'll talk about here coming up will, will really help and benefit these families. Now, group three families, um, you've got a lot less opportunity for need-based aid, even if you're going to a really expensive private university. Um, but again, the uh, there's a few things that you might forget that if you've got two students in this in school at the, in college at the same time, um, it can reduce your EFC up to 40 to 50 percent, depending on how they're calculating that. Um, now, that is one of the changes that we'll talk about here coming up, but um, that is something that might be eliminated in 24-25. So, uh, just something to keep an eye on. 
So what are you looking at? What are the grants that are available to us? Um, so what we've got here is need-based families, right? So you've got the need-based aid. That's what it's going to be called qualified for grants. So you've got Pell grants, SCOG grants, um, and then you've got MAP grant. So those are going to be the grants that are, are eligible for if you're falling into that group one families. Now, when you start going into, if you're not in group one, you're in group two or three, you don't really have a lot of options for these grants. You might be able to get some MAP grant in Illinois, but it's going to depend, right? They usually tie that to Pell grant. So it, it becomes a little bit different. So the other things that you're going to be eligible for are going to be work study, student loans, and parent plus loans. And I'm going to go into those in just a little bit in its own sections. But really, if you're looking for those grants, those are the three on the left that you want to make sure that you're maximizing. Now, in order to get any of these things, you've got to fill out your FAFSA. Um, again, you've got to fill it out early. You've got to fill it out accurately. Um, it really is going to be something that if you make mistakes on it, it can cost you a lot of money because they're going to check. If you put something down from your taxes that doesn't look right, they're going to select you for what's called verification. And then you have to provide them all your taxes and all this other stuff. And now that you had a school that you thought you can afford, guess what? Now you can't because you've made a mistake and now they've got to re, uh, redo your FAFSA and make those changes. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're, you're filling it out um, correctly and accurately. And like I said earlier, October 1st is the, is the date. So make sure you've got all your information there. Uh, it is a two-year look back on taxes. So here for 21, uh, they're going to be looking at 2019 taxes. Uh, and in 22, it's going to be 2020 taxes. So they're, they're going to keep going back a uh, two-year look back on, on, on your financial information. All right, so when you've got that, right, you filled out your FAFSA, what does it give you? Um, it gives you what's called your EFC or expected family contribution. Um, I've got the other one listed up here as SAI because in 24-25 award year, uh, they're eliminating the term EFC and changing it with SAI. Um, it's just the student aid index. Uh, what is the difference between the two of them? Absolutely nothing. Um, the only thing that's changing is that it's uh, semantics, right? Um, uh, the government changed it because they're uh, if, if they're looking at an expected family contribution, it's what you're expected to pay. And that sounds mean and harsh of them. Um, so now they're going with the student aid index of what you're eligible for. Uh, it's still going to be calculated the, the, the same way for the most part, a uh, few minor changes, but um, it's really just a, a nicer way of delivering bad news is the best way I can describe it. But really, however you want to look at it, your objective is to lower that EFC uh, as much as possible, right? The lower the EFC, the less you pay for college. You've got to remember that your, your EFC is essentially the minimum amount that you're going to pay for college. So you want to get that as low as possible. Uh, the good news is, like I said, uh, you, you do have some control over that, and we have to know a few things um, in order to update that, right? So first, we have to go know what type of assets do you have? Is it a retirement account? Is it a savings account? Um, is it uh, any other type of, uh, of asset you might have, a vacation home, anything like that? Then who owns that asset? Is it a parent asset or is it a student asset? And then finally, who earns the income? Is, is the income mostly from the student? Is it mostly from the parent? Where does that come from? All of these things make a difference because when you fill out that FAFSA, it's got a formula and it weights each one of those things differently. So for example, um, a student asset, um, so they have a savings account. Um, that, as, that, that student savings account is going to be assessed at 20 to 25%, depending on the uh, institution, how they're looking at that. Now, a parent savings account is going to be assessed at 5.64%. So you can see a strategy right there. If you've got money in a child savings account, by moving those funds from their account to the parent account, you've almost saved yourself 15% right off the bat. You're not lying about the amount of money that you have. You're strictly just switching those accounts from one person to the next. Um, so that way you can kind of uh, use those to help reduce some of those costs. So once we've got that, we've got your EFC, we know the minimum amount we've got to pay. And you're thinking to yourself, well, Matt, how do I figure out how to pay for anything? Like, what is the real cost of determining this? Um, and that's the formula that's on the screen here. So it's cost of attendance, COA, that Maribel talked about earlier, minus your EFC equals your financial need. Uh, so let's use some round numbers. Um, if you've got a cost of attendance that's $50,000 a year, and your EFC is 30,000, that's the minimum you're expected to pay, that means you've got $20,000 in demonstrated financial need. 
Why that's important is because different colleges will fill a percentage of your financial need in different ways. Uh, so uh, many of the private colleges, for example, they're going to fill about 70% of your need. Um, others may only fill like 40 or 50%. And like I talked about earlier, when you've got universities like Northwestern or University of Chicago, they're filling close to 100% of that demonstrated financial need. But what you've got to remember and what's really important here is that what the college does not fill is referred to as unmet need. So the real cost is going to be your EFC plus your unmet need. So you've really got to make sure that you're trying to get the college to cover as much of that demonstrated financial need as possible. Um, and we'll talk about a, a few ways that they can do that. They're going to either fill it with those grants and scholarships and merit aid. Uh, they can also just reduce the tuition. There's lots of different ways for them to be able to fill those, those areas for you. So make sure that we're trying to find every avenue that's available to us to reduce that. So you've got to ask the right questions, right? Um, this first question, you know, usually this will be answered on a college website or it might be brought up on your campus tour. Um, now the next two will kind of do, you got to do a little bit more digging here, right? Um, so when you say what percentage of my demonstrated financial uh, will be filled with financial aid, right? They'll, they'll tell you that on their website usually. What they're not usually telling you is how they do it. Right. So uh, if they're not filling it with gift aid, gift aid's the stuff we want, scholarships, grants, tuition discounts, all of those things. They may just tell you that we fill 70 percent of your financial need. But if they're just doing that with loans, um, either student loans or parent plus loans, they're really not helping you all that much. Right. They're just selling you up with a bunch of loans. Now, if they say that we fill 70 percent with gift aid, now you know that those costs are going to be reduced. So you can kind of really get an idea of what we're looking at with that. The last one here that you want to look at is, will my gift aid be reduced after the first year of college? You've really got to make sure you're, um, if you want to scare yourself a little bit, look at Google uh, front-loaded grants. Um, you'll find out that about 50% of colleges actually front load their need-based grants knowing that once you accept their offer, you're, you're, you're likely to stay till graduation. But you've really got to make sure that they're not just front loading you for the first two years, and then uh, all of a sudden that number gets reduced or that scholarship's not renewable, and now you're stuck, right? Now you're in a bad spot of what we're doing. So it's kind of like they, uh, they get you on the hook for it here in a little bit. Um, also, other things you want to look at in, in terms of um, any kind of grants that they're going to be offering, um, is it renewable for the subsequent years? Um, if you decide, if your student decides to study abroad, does that still count towards that? Um, are there any requirements? Are there is there any chance that you can change what's the what this program is? You don't want to get caught midstream and not have a plan to get out of it. So um, I can't say this enough. You you can never ask too many questions. Um, it's really those questions that are going to be helpful in getting to the truth of what it's going to cost you uh, to attend a particular college. So make sure you're you're bugging that financial aid uh, office. Make sure you're bugging that admissions. Uh, counselor that's going to be working with you, really work with them and ask them as many questions as possible. So Kelman Cheney's got another great piece of advice here. Um, he says, in choosing which financial snapshot to send to the colleges, send them the worst picture you can find. Um, so he's not talking about gaming the system or lying. He's really just talking about using every legal means possible uh, to present your financial picture to the college in a way that really allows you to maximize uh, that demonstrated financial need. Right? How are they going to fill those? That's what we want. We want the schools to be filling that spot. We don't want that coming out of your end. All right. So determining real costs, again, it takes another step. Right, it's not just cost of attendance minus COA, uh, COA minus EFC equals your demonstrated financial need. How you get to that calculation is also different. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different methods. I shouldn't say a lot. There's three different methodologies um, in determining your financial aid. Uh, the first one is going to be the federal methodology. This is going to be the most common one. This is going to be used by the majority of your schools, public, state schools. Uh, most are going to be using this. There's also what's called the institutional methodology um, that uh, is used by some more of the elite universities, um, where essentially they pick and choose what they want to look at from your finances. And then there's the consensus methodology. Now, this is going to be the elite schools. Um, they kind of came up with this uh, idea where they're going to look at it the same way, so they're not competing against one another. Um, but the reason that this is important is because there's some financial strategies we're going to talk about. They might be great for the federal methodology but they don't do you any good if you're going to an institutional methodology school. 
So you really have to know this information before you go ahead and just jump out and say, oh, I'm going to go move this funding around. You don't want to do that. You really want to make sure you're understanding why you're moving those funds and making sure that it's going to actually help you in the long run. So let's read off some of the, the differences or, or things that go into each one. Um, the federal methodology uh, does not consider untaxed income. Uh, in 2024, 24-25, uh, they're going to be eliminating that um, uh, that part of it. So any untaxed income is not going to be related on there. Um, does not count um, contributions from grandparents. Again, this is going to be coming in 24-25. Right now, uh, if if the grandparents do want to pay, they're, they're not going to be looking at it directly, but uh, you don't want the grandparents sending that check directly to the school. You'd rather them write you, the parent, the check, and then you write the check to the school um, from your account. That way, um, they're not they're not seeing outside funds because when they see that, they're like, oh, that must be student income, must be untaxed income on the student, and they're going to go ahead and uh, look at that at a 20% uh, assessment rate. Again, in 24-25, that's going to change. They don't care who pays in 24-25. Uh, that's not going to come uh, become a problem. So that's one good thing of these changes in 24-25 are coming. Um, the federal methodology does not assess any home equity at this time, uh, and it does not assess any sibling assets. So if you've got a younger uh, child that has $5,000 in a savings account, they're not going to ask you questions about that. It's not going to show up anywhere. Uh, the other good thing is that they do have some income protection allowance. Um, so right now it's like $6,670 um, that um, it really doesn't go into the assessment. So a student can earn that and it doesn't hurt them. Um, that is actually going up pretty significantly in 23-24. That number is going up to $9,410. So uh, a big swing there um, as well. So again, some things that are uh, positive in nature in terms of these changes. So um, first things, try to keep those income, uh, students' income below those amounts. All right, now with the institutional methodology, everything I just told you, you kind of throw it out the window, right? Um, institutional methodology, um, really, uh, they get to pick what they want to look at. Um, so they may assess non-custodial parent assets. Home equity is often assessed. Sibling assets are assessed. Any small business value is assessed. Um, and um, money sent from family members outside of the household may be assessed as student income. So the institutional methodology, they can really pick and choose what they want. So you have to do what's called a CSS profile on top of your FAFSA, where basically these schools are saying, you know what? what the government asked you wasn't good enough. We want to know more details. Um, and then they will determine your EFC based off of their own methodology. So um, really, you've got to make sure you know which one's going at there. So, I mean, just like this one, um, home equity is not assessed on the federal methodology, and it is on the institutional methodology. So if you've got a savings account uh, with some, some money sitting in there, that's going to be looked at on your FAFSA. If you're going to a federal methodology school, you might think to yourself, well, what I can do is I can just put that into to pay down my mortgage, right? I could put that into my home equity uh, to get that off. That would be a great solution um, if you had that ability with the federal methodology. But if your student then decides to go to an institutional methodology school, all you've done is taking a liquid asset that you had the ability to get pretty easily and put it into something that didn't really help you because they just looked at it the same way. So you've really got to understand uh, which schools they're looking at and what methodology they're using. And you can usually find that on their websites as well. The last one is the consensus methodology. Again, 21 schools got together uh, and said, hey, we're going to look at this the same way. Um, your home equity is going to be based off of your income, not necessarily the actual equity. Um, and student assets are at a flat 5% across the board um, instead of the 25%. So um, some good, some bad. Again, it depends on, on what schools you're looking at. So there's a couple strategies that we can kind of chat through here real quick. Um, first one is going to be keeping your students income under that protection allowance. Again, um, you never want to uh, be taking out. Um, we never want to discourage the children from working, right? We want them to start doing this and start being successful, but we also don't want them to earn things that are going to hurt them on the FAFSA. So if there's a possibility of, uh, of getting close to that $6,660, um, then you can say, all right, maybe at the end of the year, take the last couple of weeks off and then you can restart again in January if possible, things along those lines. Um, same thing for parents. Don't take any capital gains during your base years. Always try to offset any capital gains with capital losses uh, because those capital gains are going to be assessed as income each year that you fill out your FAFSA. 
Uh, same thing, postponing your bonuses if possible, um, raises if you're self-employed. Um, so like if you're a child, we're going to uh, be going in um, to college in, in 2021 uh, and your company usually gives you a bonus in December of, of, of 2019, um, maybe you can see if they can bump it till January instead, right? Um, depending on the size of that bonus, uh, it could be, you know, again, it's a two-year look back on taxes, right? So that could be three years almost to where that doesn't show up on that FAFSA. So it can really save you some money in the long run if if you have that option available to you. Uh, and then finally, time charitable donations. Um, uh, charitable, donation, charitable donations can lower your taxes. Uh, lower taxes can also increase your EFC. Um, so you really want to accelerate your contributions either prior to or after your base year. So um, running the, the years leading up to uh, going to, uh, for filling out your FAFSA or the years after. Um, again, you might end up with those same tax benefits, but you might also save some money on your college costs. I really recommend talking to your accountant on this one to make sure that you're not uh, just robbing Peter to pay Paul. All right, so what are some of the assets, right? We know what they're looking at in terms of, you know, uh, what, what, what's assessed, but what are some of the actual tangible assets that they're looking at? Uh, savings accounts, cash, CDs, money market accounts, uh, stocks and mutual funds. Uh, mutual funds can actually be one of the worst places to put your college savings. Uh, that's because they generate uh, internal dividends and capital gains to which you really don't have any control over. Um, and then, of course, dividends and capital gains are going to be considered income uh, and they're going to be assessed at 47 percent um, uh, as income on the year. But the asset itself, the value of that asset is also going to be assessed at that 5.64%. So you really get a double whammy on, on mutual funds. So not the best place to put those. Uh, so if you have any bonds, even tax exempt bonds, custodial accounts, UGMAs, UTMAs, those all have to be listed on the FAFSA. Uh, 529 plans. Um, now, what's good about 529s is they're a really great way for families to save for college because they've got that tax-free growth and that tax-free distribution. Uh, but one of the problems is that 529s are considered a parent asset. So that amount actually does get listed on your FAFSA and is assessed at that 5.64% interest rate. So uh, not always a great way. Uh, there's other ways that you can uh, kind of go about saving for those without it showing up on your FAFSA. Uh, and if you do have any vacation homes, um, if you live uh, in them for uh, a part of the year or uh, anything like that, they cannot be converted into a business asset. Um, if it's not something that you you live in and you strictly do it for like uh, Airbnb or something along those lines, um, do what's legally required uh, to have that converted to a legally recognized business and not just something on your personal. Um, that way it won't be listed on your FAFSA uh, and you can kind of use those assets that way. So what are some of the things they don't look at? Um, where could we you know, possibly have some, some, some leeway when we're, we're doing this? Uh, first one is going to be retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs. They're not going to be asking you about those. Uh, personal items, um, so cars, furniture. Um, maybe the dads in the audience are looking to a new BMW or Mercedes. Uh, if you can find one right now, uh, you could go ahead and buy one. Uh, not good financial advice, but it won't hurt you on your FAFSA. Moms, uh, any, any new jewelry that you're looking out there, feel free. But um, again, uh, not good financial advice, but it won't show up on your FAFSA. So personal items aren't included. Um, any home equity, uh, except if you're using that uh, uh, CSS profile and talking about that institutional methodology school. Um, any cash value held in life insurance policies and annuities. Um, you really want to make sure that you're talking to a competent financial advisor who understands college funding uh, about using cash value in life insurance or annuities to reduce college costs. Um, purchasing a qualified annuity, for example, is not a good move if you're going to attend a university or a college that uses the institutional methodology because they do get assessed at 5% of their value. So um, you might think that you're doing something well with that annuity, but uh, always not going to be um, the right path. So make sure you're working with financial advisors that understand that. All right, now the ugly part, the loans, right? There's the the, the, the necessary evil sometimes that, that come with these, um, but we can help you along the way and get you a little bit understand. Um, first, you've got to be a smart borrower. You've got to understand the difference between a federal student loan and a private student loan. Um, we're going to try and keep that uh, debt proportional uh, to expected for future earnings. So good rule of thumb on this one is um, whatever they're going to take out, um, whatever student loans we're looking to take out for their lifetime should be equivalent to about one year salary um, when you start looking at it um, of the average of whatever profession they're looking at. If you're taking more than that, 
you, you're already kind of putting yourself behind the eight ball. So you want to kind of keep those balanced at that point. Uh, you also want to know uh, the loan borrowing limits. Um, if you have extra loans, right? If you, uh, uh, students love to say at, our, at my school, well, I got my refund check. Uh, there's no refund about it. It's just extra loan money, right? That just means that you're spending something at a 3% interest rate. Um, so um, I, if you have any extra funds left over at the end, the school typically sends that to the school. I always recommend you send that back to the lender to help reduce those payments. Um, and you really want to learn how the interest rate works for student loans. And we're going to get into that here in just a second. So first, we've got to talk about what's the difference, federal or private loans? Um, well, we always say when in doubt, choose federal. Doesn't mean that that's going to be right for everyone, but you got to do your own research on some of these things. Um, the benefits uh, to the federal loans is that um, there's a subsidized loan. Um, at worst, there's an unsubsidized loan. Um, so every student, regardless of family income, is eligible for at least an unsubsidized Stafford loan, which is going to be $5,500 for the first year, $6,500 for the second year, and then $7,500 for years three and four. Um, these are loans that we actually do usually recommend that, that, that students take out. Uh, it has, uh, it really kind of grounds them a little bit, right? It gives them a little bit of skin in the game. Um, and also really it helps pay for college, but they feel a little bit more connected. They're not just there on mom and dad's dime. Um, and again, we're not talking about crazy amounts of, of money that, you know, you hear these horror stories of, um, well, I took out $80,000 in student loans. Usually it's because they're not following these guidelines, right? They're, they're taking private loans on top of their student loans. That's when you get to those numbers. Um, the actual number that you can take out total for your lifetime, and again, these are the maximums per year, but $57,500 is the most you can take out for a bachelor's degree um, over the course of your lifetime. So just something to keep in mind on that. Uh, the federal loans also have what's known as a parent plus loan and a grad plus loan. A uh, grad plus loan is if you're doing some graduate school, um, it's an additional loan you can take out. Now with private loans, it's really two types. There's a student loan, there's a parent loan. And we'll talk about the pros and cons here a little bit, but the big difference is uh, the federal, you can repay based off of income. So when you graduate, you consolidate those loans and you can do what's called an income-based repayment. The idea behind this is that the amount of money that they're, they're making fresh out of school, you hope is going to be the lowest amount they're ever going to make, right? You want to keep building up from that future. So if you've got a payment locked in at a reasonable number, uh, you can make those payments and you can make additional payments along the way, but you, your minimums aren't going to be as painful if you do it this way. Um, there is forgiveness um, options for some. There is uh, the public service loan forgiveness program. So if they're working for a nonprofit uh, for 10 consecutive years uh, and have made the minimum payments along the way on their student loans, the difference can then be forgiven. So there's lots of options out, out there for that. Um, if you're looking at the Parent PLUS loan, uh, there is no, uh, I'm sorry, there's no credit check for the student loans. They just automatically get them. The Parent PLUS loan, they do have a credit check for those. Um, and again, interest rates do uh, vary a little bit, but they're set for the year by Congress every, every year they set a number. Right now, they're, they're, they're not historically low. Last year was the historic low, and now we're at uh, just a little bit up from that, but they're still like within the 3% range. So um, not crazy interest rates on those. Um, and again, there is uh, limits to how much a student can take out. So you're not getting over your head a little bit. Now with the private loans, um, you really don't have much in the way of repayment options. It's kind of like a traditional loan, like you take it out, you pay for it. Um, forgiveness isn't really an option. They don't have forgiveness options. Um, federal loans, th there's even things like if you get uh, permanently disabled, on, you know, God forbid, but if that happens, they do have some forgiveness options on that. Private loans don't. Uh, you've got to pay and you got to keep paying on them. Um, you've got to have good credit, which is why most students don't take them out because they can't um, they, they can't get the credit for, right? So then the parent has to become the co-signer for it. And really, I, you know, you'd rather probably just go the federal route just so you can make sure that you've got at least one thing in that student's name over there. Uh, the interest rates are always going to be based off of credit. Uh, and there are really, um, uh, there's no limits. So again, that's why I say when you hear people saying, I took out $80,000 in student loans to get a bachelor's degree. Well, that's why, right? They've taken out those private loans and there's no limits. There's no checks to those. So uh, we always say when in doubt, go federal. But again, do your own research. Perhaps one of these other uh, interest rates would be at a lower rate for you based off of your credit. Um, so you can always explore them. Uh, but federal just has a little bit more flexibility. 
All right. So let's talk specifically about the Parent PLUS loan. Um, a lot of parents we hear don't want it, right? Uh, why do they avoid it? Well, it's got a higher interest rate. It's a, at uh, over 7% right now. Uh, and there's also a 4% origination fee uh, every year when you take out a new loan. So every time that those uh, those loans come up and you've got to take out more, you've got to pay that origination fee as it goes. Um, the other reason why is they're not aware of the income-based repayment options. Now, there, there are a couple out there. Um, again, they're not advertised. So that's why it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, now, why do we think... Um, why do we try to say you should at least consider it if it's an option for you? Um, there's no loan forgiveness under that Parent PLUS loan program itself. Um, the reason we look at it is that the option is only available if you first ask your loan servicer to consolidate your loans into what's called the Federal Loan Consolidation Program. Once you've done that, um, you can start making repayments based off of discretionary income. Um, and that's going to be kind of calculated in different ways, right? Uh, it deducts uh, the poverty guidelines for, for a family of two, uh, and it does not count any untaxed income. So including untaxed social security income, things like that. Um, so really, uh, you, you want to take a look at it and say, is there an option for me to do this, right? Um, if you have one parent that perhaps is closer to retirement, this might be something that you'd want to take out in their name because once they've retired, you're paying those things back under discretionary income. When you're retired, you don't have much in the way of discretionary income. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Same thing if you have one parent that uh, makes significantly less, um, that's a good option to go for as well. So you can kind of make sure that you're leaving all of your options open um, when you do have to go to consolidate these. Um, the uh, the other one that we got is there is um, forgiveness that, that can happen in either 10 or 25 years. So after all the kids are out of college and it's finally time to start paying back that loan, uh, if the parent sign that parent if the parent signing the parent plus loan um, has a part-time income of let's say I don't know, like 15,000, uh, which is that's currently below the poverty guidelines, um, you can have maybe another extra 25,000 in untaxed social security income um, or even withdrew $35,000 from a Roth IRA, uh, that parent's going to consider to have zero discretionary income. Um, so that really gives you some of those uh, options to pay it back. Now, if um, you're working for a not-for-profit, you can also earn that forgiveness uh, and, and have that entire loan balance uh, paid off uh, in 10 years. If not, there is also forgiveness in 25 years as well. There is a tax hit that happens with that, um, but again, I, I much rather deal with the tax hit than having to pay back those loans. So, um, if you do work for a nonprofit, you plan on working there for longer, uh, it is something that you might want to consider. Uh, and finally, uh, again, I hate talking about these things, but the, the, I, I point them out because the federal uh, loans do have more flexibility. If the parent signing the loan uh, either dies or becomes permanently disabled, the loan balance is discharged against them and there is no tax consequences for that. You're not going to get that same with the private lender. Um, so that federal gives you a little bit more about that. So. Um, why don't parents know more about this, the, the benefits of doing the federal loan consolidation? Well, there's a quote from, from, from Navient, who is one of the biggest lenders. Uh, when they, they got uh, busted quite a few years ago, uh, they found out in internal emails that they had said, there is not a reasonable expectation that the loan servicer will act in the interest of the consumer. So you got to remember that. Like that's right there. You can tell when I say college is a business. It's a business. So um, you really want to make sure that uh, you're finding this information out and working on consolidate them because the lenders, they're not going to tell you like, oh, you might benefit from this. If you're paying, they don't care, right? They're just going to keep taking that money as it comes through. So um, really be making sure that we're asking those questions. And I always warn uh, on any of this before we end this workshop um, that uh, the current provisions that we're talking about tonight they can be eliminated at any time, right? So like just because there's a parent plus loan and this is what it is today doesn't mean in three years that it's going to be available. I don't see it changing, but I don't know. So I don't want you to think that this information is uh, forever. Uh, it can change year to year. Congress can make changes to these things, um, but th that's just something we always want to give as a, a disclaimer about it. But I want to leave you uh, with this, right? So this is the six biggest mistakes uh, when you're paying for college, right? So if you don't take anything else away from this tonight, take this away. Now, the first one is going to be saving in a child's name. It's the most common mistake. We talked about it earlier. If you've got a child uh, that has a uh, $20,000 savings account in their name, uh, you will have raised your EFC by four to $5,000 just by keeping that in their name. If you move that into the parent's account, you're going to be saving 15% right off the top. So 
again, make sure that you're looking at all those options. Another mistake we see families make is going to be using distributions from IRAs or 401ks. Um, the government will waive those fees, right? You've got a 10% penalty. They'll, they'll, they'll waive that. The colleges, however, they don't care. Your distributions are considered income by the college and parent income is going to be assessed at 47%. Um, some families think that they can use Roth money to get away with it, but as of right now, untaxed income is still included on that FAFSA. Again, in 2425, we're hoping that that changes. Uh, number three is not using the appeals process, uh, especially if there's been a change in the financial circumstances. Um, if uh, How much has changed in the last six months? How much has changed in the last two years, right? It's two-year-old tax information. So particularly right now in this COVID environment that we're in, um, a two-year look back on income isn't really valid, right? So if there's been changes, reduction of hours, not getting bonuses, things along those lines, communicate that with both the admissions and the financial aid office uh, about that situation, because it's possible that you might be able to negotiate and say, listen, let's look at this current income situation, and they can reduce that EFC that way. Number four is not applying to enough colleges. Um, this has put a lot of families in a bind. And I talked about this with the merit aid a little bit. Um, you really want to make sure that you're, you're not limiting your options. Um, so um, if you've got schools that are kind of apples to apples fit, you can leverage them and see who's going to give more merit aid and see if you can use them against one another. They Again, they do work with you. It's not quite as bad as buying a used car, but it's getting there, right? I've seen more appeals go through in the last few years than I ever have. Uh, number five is not asking enough questions on your college visit. Again, you've really got to make sure you're asking the time, taking the time to ask the questions of how your financial aid is going to be received. What are we looking at? How is it going to be packaged together? You can't ask enough questions when you're on that college visit or, or calling the financial aid office. Uh, and finally, not starting early enough, right? You've really got to make sure that you're giving yourself enough runway so that you can uh, make these changes. Again, we're looking at two-year-old tax information. So you've really got to be prepared two years ahead of time um, before you start looking at some of these things. Um, again, if you're trying to move assets around, it's not always as easy as snapping your finger and moving some assets. So you really want to make sure that um, you're understanding the full process and, and really taking your time with it. Uh, so this is kind of what we just went through here tonight. So in the chat, what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to put a link in here real quick. Let's get to everyone. There's a quick link in here. So what I'd like you to do is, uh, if you could, uh, first, uh, thank you for attending and, and going through this information with us. I know it's been a lot. And I know that you've got a lot more questions as well. So uh, for attending tonight, we are offering a, a personalized free conference uh, over the phone with either our founder, Jack, uh, or one of our senior client service managers that will kind of really briefly review your financial situation. We'll point out a couple of things that might uh, help lower your EFC. Uh, and we'll also provide three college reports um, of the college of your choice, giving you an estimated reading of what your, your EFC is going to look like. Uh, even if it's a few years out, kind of gives you an idea what you're looking up for. Um, so again, um, that's going to be included here tonight. So uh, the link I posted in the chat, uh, if you go there, um, there's a quick survey that just kind of gives us a, a little bit of feedback about how we did tonight, uh, make sure that we're providing content that's uh, useful to you guys. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, it'll give you the opportunity to go ahead and sign up for one of those free conferences. So I'll give you guys just a minute uh, to look through that. Um, so I'll pause for just a moment, let you guys get through that survey real quick. And I need a drink. I've been talking for way too long here today, guys. Well, as always tonight, like our, our goal was to provide you with some helpful and creative ways to reduce some college costs and really understand how those student loans, parent plus loans, scholarships, all of those work. But uh, just by completing the survey, Again, if you don't want to uh, attend one of the conferences, not a big deal. Um, we won't contact you in any way. But uh, just for completing the survey, um, we will send you um, some additional information of the 10 most forgotten strategies that can save uh, $50,000 or more uh, at the cost of a four-year college. Again, these aren't things that you can just Google and get the information on. These are things that we've created um, along the way uh, and can be a really great tool for you. So we'll make sure we uh, email you a copy of that as well. Um, but again, um, if you have any other questions, um, we will be available here to you. Um, if you are going to be doing one of those conferences, um, I do recommend just trying to schedule one as soon as possible. We do over 100 workshops and webinars a year. Um, and again, we want to make sure we're able to get you that information when it's fresh in your mind and, and, and going through it. But um, just uh, take another minute to fill those out. Um, like uh, Maribel said, uh, we'll look here in the chat. I don't see any questions right now. Um, I do see that the uh, the library does have paying for college by Calvin Chain 
Cheney. So I want you all rushing to the library right now to grab that. Um, but if there's any questions in the chat, feel free to use that. Um, we'll answer anything you might have. And um, again, uh, if there are any uh, Spanish speaking, Maribel can help with that as well. So um, great, we'll, we'll kind of wait for any questions here. All right, we've got one. Um, could you quickly explain again the kids' savings account raises the EFC? Yes. So um, your child savings account is looked at or uh, let's say weighted differently when you fill out the FAFSA. So a child savings account is going to be assessed at 20%. So 20% of that value is what's going to go on that EFC. Now, a parent savings account is only assessed at 5.64% of its value. Uh, so by moving the funds from one child to the next, um, we're, you know, or I'm sorry, from one child to the parent's account, you're not lying about the total money that you have, um, but you are just making sure that you're not getting that uh, higher assessment as you go through it. All right, next one. Uh, if I have two 529 plans, one for each kid, should I move the money to the youngest child? Uh, no, um, I, I don't know that that's going to help you. I mean, it's just going to hurt you one way or another, right? They're going to ask you for the value of that 529 right off the bat. So I can't really give you, a, this is one of those ones where I always like to say, I can't give you a blanket statement, unfortunately, because again, your financial is going to be different than somebody else's. So saving that 529 might be valuable to you. It might be more valuable to you to use it all right in the beginning on one child. Um, so it's really going to kind of um, figure out your financial. So in that conference uh, that, that we've offered, if you uh, kind of bring that information, we'll be able to guide you a little bit better on that one. Uh, not starting early enough. When is the right time to start? Junior year, high school, early senior? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say even sophomore year of starting to get that um, uh, looks at what schools we're looking at. Because um, again, your tax information or, or, or any of those things, again, that's two years look back. So you, you'll have to start by then. Uh, but as terms of um, what schools and things like that, start exploring in, in sophomore year, junior year, really great. And then once you start getting into senior year, October of that senior year is when you have to fill out the FAFSA and kind of start making some decisions. So um, you really uh, start in as early as possible. So I'd say sophomore, junior year for sure. Uh, name of the book is Paying for College. Uh, and it's by Kelman Cheney. Oh, thank you, Maribel. Uh, let's see. Would attending a two-year college then moving to a four-year college, uh, oh, lost my question there, uh, two-year college finish your last year be cheaper? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, community colleges um, are a great way to do that. Um, again, you're paying pennies on the dollar for the same courses. Um, I had, um, my uh, niece was uh, about to go to college and she was asking me about this and I said, go to junior college. It was my expenditure because she didn't really know what she wanted to do, kind of just kind of out there. Um, not really passionate about anything. And she said, uh, I said, why don't you go to junior college? And she goes, oh, I don't want to go to junior college. And I said, well, why not? And she's like, well, I don't know. Like, wouldn't that look bad on my uh, resume that I went to junior college? And I said, uh, I said, the last time I checked, whenever you graduate from uh, someplace with your, your bachelor's degree, it just says University of Illinois. It doesn't say University of Illinois for two years and then junior college for two years, right? You don't have that information out there. So yeah, it's a great way to, to save money uh, in the long run as well. Uh, next question uh, we've got, do all schools reduce merit financial aid by the amount of outside scholarship you receive? No, you've really got to ask that question, right? So you don't, we don't know how that happens. We're saying it looks like about, from the information we're seeing, about 50% do. Um, so you've really got to ask how they apply that. Uh, by law, they're required to tell you how they do that uh, or post it somewhere that says um, how they're going to be handling those things. So you can ask them those questions for sure. All right, I know we're up at time here. So I've got one last question um, we'll get to here. Um, for assets, you said uh, 529 being a parent asset, but I think I heard you were saying it was a negative for it. Uh, I thought it's better to be a parent asset than not. Correct, it is going to be, uh, a parent asset is better than a student asset. Uh, the point we're making of 529s being um, not the best place to do it is because they show up at all on your FAFSA, right? There might be better places for you to put those funds um, that can give you the same kind of growth that won't be a negative impact in either way for you or the student, right? It could just be something that the FAFSA isn't asking about. Um, so that's what we're saying about that. But yes, in general, the 529 being a parent asset is a better thing, um, but there are better options out there than just using the 529 plan. 
All right, great. Um, so I'll, we'll go ahead and leave it there. I know we're up on time. I want to be uh, cognizant of, of the library's time. And, and again, thank you uh, for having us tonight. Thank you for going through all this information with us. Again, if you've got more specific questions, you can follow us on, on all the social medias there. Um, again, sign up for that free conference if you've got specific questions. Um, I, my favorite saying is that um, with financial aid, everything's not a nail and there's not a hammer to, to take them down, right? You've got to make sure that you're, you're looking at all the options. And I can't really get a good feel of, of a good strategy for you without having that whole picture. Um, so we can definitely give you more information on that. But uh, thank you again for attending and I'll turn it back over to, uh, to the library. Thank you so much, Matt and Marbella for your awesome presentation as usual. Uh, lots and lots of good information. I, I do recommend that everybody, uh, if possible, take advantage of some of the free classes that my college planning team is offering, fill out their survey, um, and keep an eye on the library's website as well because we often have workshops here with my college planning team. Uh, so thank you everybody for attending tonight. Uh, thank you to our presenters, and I hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you very much. Awesome. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Guys.